And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. Hello and welcome to This is the End, a PopMythology.com podcast. I'm your host, the Pop Mythologist. This episode is very late and long overdue. I've had some personal stuff going on for the past month or so that's taken up pretty much all my free time and energy and which just completely took over my life for a while. Anyway, to the listeners out there, thank you for your patience. I definitely do try my best to put out these episodes with some regularity, though given the highly unpredictable nature of my current life circumstances, there's only so much I can do when those circumstances intensify. With that said, I want to jump right into today's episode. Today I'm going to talk about and recommend my 10 best films about war from the civilian's perspective. That's not a very clickable BuzzFeed ready title, but nevertheless, I'll be counting down 10 movies about war from the point of view of ordinary civilians that I think are powerful films to be watching and meditating on during this time and letting them work through us and open our hearts and minds and hopefully deepening our empathy. I think the reason that I've chosen this topic for this episode is uh, pretty obvious. And it's also very relevant to the theme of this podcast because war is one of the most common and biggest factors of societal collapse. Sometimes it might be just one among numerous contributing factors that gradually lead to collapse. And sometimes the war itself is the collapse. Just a couple of things to point out about this list. First of all, every film on this list focuses on the experience of civilians rather than soldiers. There are many great films about the soldier experience, but I wanted to focus on the experience of regular civilians because, generally speaking, it's the civilians who tend to suffer the most. This isn't to say that soldiers don't suffer, obviously they do, but civilians, largely because of their defenseless nature and the fact that they're unarmed and just many other reasons, often tend to suffer the most. Now, there are some films where the boundaries are not clear. For example, one of the best war movies ever made, I think, is The Deer Hunter where we see the characters as soldiers, but we also see them as veterans who have returned from the war and are trying to resume, quote unquote, a normal civilian life. But I try to avoid even films like that and really just stick with movies that are just about civilians. Although a few of the films on this list do involve civilian resistance movements, which um, involve civilians doing things that normally soldiers tend to do. And so there are some shades of gray there. The second thing I try to do is move around geographically and include different regions of the world, as well as different conflicts. Inevitably, numerous movies on this list are about World War II, just because there are so many films about World War II. Uh, so it's hard to avoid. But I did try to include films that revolve around other conflicts and, as I mentioned, other regions of the world rather than just the U.S. or Europe. Also, there will not be any spoilers for any of the films on this list. So rest assured, you can listen to the entire episode. And um, I just want to point out that the films on this list are pretty intense, or at least most of them are. And for that reason, I don't know that you want to watch these films back to back. I mean, you could... And it might even be a transformative experience in some ways. But if you're someone who, let's say, like struggles with mental health challenges and you know that watching a dark film can aggravate feelings of depression or hopelessness or anxiety, then definitely proceed with caution. And a few of the films on this list warrant specific content warnings that I will mention and explain when I get to those films. Lastly, I hope this discussion, as well as the movies themselves, give you some things to ponder as we witness the developments of the situation in Ukraine 
in addition to seeing all the footage of people suffering just on the news, art also has its place, as I often talk about on this and on other podcasts. And so perhaps these films can inspire you if you're in a situation that permits it to try to help in some way, no matter how small, to help alleviate the suffering of people during wartime, even if it's just a couple dollars, certain skills you might have, or other potential resources. So without further ado, let's begin. Number 10 is a film called The Day I Lost My Shadow, a Syrian film written and directed by Sudade Kadan and released in 2018. It takes place during the Syrian civil war, and the plot is quite simple. As you know, in wartime, especially when the war is happening within your own borders, basic everyday resources that we all take for granted can become scarce. And so the plot setup is that a young mother named Sana wants to cook dinner for her son, but she's out of propane gas for her stove. And it's not just the gas, their whole apartment is uh, suffering from a shutdown of numerous utilities and a lack of resources. So their water is turned off and just everything sucks in this situation. And here she is, she just wants to cook a hot meal for her hungry son and, and there's no gas. So she sets out to find a cylinder of gas. You know, it's like, I'll be right back, son. And there begins her descent into hell. So it's, it's pretty clear while you're watching this film that it had a limited budget. You know, it's a little bit rough and it very much looks and feels like an independent film. Um, which is to say for folks who are used to Hollywood movies, it may feel uh, slow at times and perhaps even boring. But Sudari Kadan really makes the best of her limited budget and is able to express something kind of ineffable, which is the elevated meaning that small actions can take on, you know, the simple act of cooking a meal for her son and how that can become elevated in a situation of adversity. And not only that, but how even this very simple act of trying to find just a canister of gas becomes this epic, dangerous quest for survival. The film is really good at kind of expressing the surreal nature of that. Okay, so that's the day I lost my shadow. Number nine is a 2010 film called As If I Am Not There, directed by Irish filmmaker Juanita Wilson. Even though it's technically an Irish film, it's shot in the Serbo-Croatian language and takes place in the Balkans during the Bosnian War. So now this is one of those films that I mentioned earlier that I have a specific content warning for. There are some very graphic and disturbing scenes of sexual violence, both explicit and implicit. Some historical context, even though rape is something that frequently occurs in war in general, during the Bosnian War, mass systemic rape was used as a weapon of terror by the Bosnian Serbs against Bosniak women and girls as part of their program of ethnic cleansing and terror. Literally tens of thousands of women were raped repeatedly in concentration camps specifically set up for this purpose. And it's believed that most estimates actually fall short of, of the real number because so many cases were likely unreported. And as a part of the mental and emotional torture, the women and girls who became pregnant were forced to go the full term and give birth. So needless to say, unspeakably horrific stuff, uh, but to the film's credit, it does a good job of bringing sensitivity to its subject matter while at the same time, not shying away from the horror of it. Next, number eight is the 1988 film Red Sorghum, directed by Zhang Yimou, one of the great filmmakers of the so-called fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers. Now, this is an interesting choice to include on this list because war isn't mainly what the film's about. It's only part of it. But when it does happen, the way it happens is so powerful that I thought the film was worth including on this list. It's also a pretty short film, just about an hour and a half long. And the first whole hour, we don't even see war break out yet. What the first hour does do is set up the world, like this local traditional world of farmers and winemakers. And it does this in really vivid, exquisite detail with some of Zhang Yimao's beautiful stylistic flourishes. And then when the war does break out, in this case, the second Sino-Japanese war, 
it makes the violence and the atrocities that much more of a shocking contrast to the humble and quiet existence of the protagonist that came before it during the entire first hour. And it isn't a spoiler to mention this, but there's a scene in which soldiers from the Japanese Imperial Army are forcing the Chinese farmers to cut down their own field to make way for a highway that the Japanese soldiers want to build and use for military purposes. So yes, on the surface, this is very much about the evils of imperialism. But for me, the way I like to interpret the symbolism of this is that the Japanese army here represents industrialism itself. And the way industrialism combined with war and imperialism ravages and just destroys local non-industrial cultures and heritage. There's also a bit of civilian resistance that we get to see in Red Sorghum, uh, which is the entire focus of the next film, number seven, which is the 2008 Danish film Flame and Citroen about the Danish resistance movement during World War II. Now, what's remarkable is that even though the people of nations that were occupied by the Nazis didn't collaborate in the Holocaust, they did save their Jewish citizens either. You know, individuals did, but collectively people did not. But the exception was Denmark, where large numbers of Danish people across the entire country collectively resisted the Nazis and actively protected the country's Jewish citizens. So much so that 98% of Danish Jews were able to stay alive during and after the war. And the Danish people did this because they didn't see their Jewish citizens as Jews. They saw them as Danes. Granted, there were some historical circumstances that gave them certain advantages in doing this. But still, I think it's a pretty amazing historical fact. Anyway, Flame and Citroen focuses on a small group of Danish resistance fighters, primarily two guys, one of them with the codename Flame and the other with the codename Citroen, hence the title Flame and Citroen. Both of these guys are serious badasses and both of them actual historical figures. Apparently, the co-writer and director Ole Christian Madsen did a lot of research and he wanted to keep the story as close to the actual history as possible. And even though it's based on real history, this movie is the closest to feeling like an, you know, like a traditional action movie or a spy thriller out of all the movies on this list. You know, there's this great action scene in this film that reminded me of the big shootout scene in Scarface, um, the, the Brian De Palma version. And while watching the scene, I thought, oh, no way, that, that's just totally Hollywood <laughs> influence. But then I read about it, and apparently the real-life version of the scene was actually even more badass, which is just you know, mind-boggling. And so this whole film is, uh, as I said, the most sort of conventionally exciting on this list. Uh, but even so, it doesn't let us off easy either, and it does show some of the moral ambiguities, complexities, and yes, the horrors that do come up during war, even when... You're trying to do the right thing. Okay, number six is another Zhang Yimou film called To Live. And there are two reasons why I chose this film. One is that even during war, uh, despite all the horrors and atrocities that occur during war, in this case, the Chinese Civil War, there can still be some moments of joy, of tenderness for the people who are trying to survive. And this film does a really good job of showing that. The other reason I chose it is that war itself is not the only thing that causes so much misery and suffering for the people whose lives are torn apart by it. War can lead to major societal and political changes and disruptions, which in this film take the form of the Cultural Revolution. And uh, these disruptions and changes in themselves continue to keep causing misery and suffering for people long after the war itself may have ended. And this film does a great job of showing that and, and showing how ordinary people get swept up in large political movements and revolutions. And regardless of how they might personally feel about those movements or revolutions, they try to adapt, which sometimes might just mean pretending 
to play along with the dominant political ideology of the moment, whatever that may be, just as a way to not stand out, you know, to fit in and survive. In fact, the Chinese government received this film as anti-communist and they banned the film itself domestically. And they also banned Zhang Yimou from making any more films for two years as a sort of, you know, slap on the wrist or, um, you know, penalty. I suspect they only made it two years because Zhang Yimou's other films brought a lot of international acclaim and attention to Chinese film. So this was kind of like them saying, okay, you know, don't do this again, but, but we keep making all those movies that bring us all the awards and stuff. Next, number five, is Germany Year Zero, released in 1948, the oldest film on this list, and directed by the great Italian filmmaker Roberto Rossellini. Now, with the other World War II films on this list, we see how civilians of countries that were the target of Nazi aggression suffer. But this film is really interesting because we see how ordinary German civilians suffer uh, in the wake of World War II. In some ways, I feel like this film works almost as a documentary because it was made just a few short years after the war. And so Rossellini and his crew have this amazing ready-made film set in which we get to see all these destroyed buildings and ruins. And the family who are the protagonists in this film live in a part of Berlin that was hit particularly hard. And we see as this family struggles to survive with uh, every resource being scarce, you know, a persistent theme throughout many of the films on this list. And, uh, you know, they have rationed limits on power. So they're often working in the dark because they have to. And during this time, German civilians were given ration cards in which manual laborers were given more food than non-manual workers. And so the film's protagonist family has it extra hard because... They have four members, but only three ration cards. And those ration cards are non-manual labor ration cards. And the older brother doesn't have a ration card because he's in hiding. Because he was actually a German soldier during the war and Germany is occupied by allied forces. So he's afraid of what will happen if he comes out of hiding. So in early scene, the younger brother tries to get a manual labor job so that he can get his ration card upgraded so that he can get more food so that the family can have enough to eat. But basically he's caught uh, and is not allowed to do manual labor because he's just too young. And then the sister goes to nightclubs at night to flirt with men so that they'll give her cigarettes, which she just kind of goes like, okay, thank you. And they're like, here, let me give you a light. She's like, no, I'm, just, I'm not going to smoke it just now. I'm going to save it for later. They're like, okay, sure. And, uh, but the reason she's saving them is so that she can use these cigarettes for bartering. And to make matters worse, their father is very sick, but can't get into a hospital because the hospitals are just too full and overflowing with uh, too many patients, which sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And throughout the entire film, we see this family go through one hardship after another. And in this film, you know, it just shows how war is horrible for everyone if you're a civilian. Moving on to number four. This is a 1985 Russian film called Come and See. The title comes from the book of Revelations, chapter six, verse seven, which was part of the quote that I opened today's episode with. This is another film that needs a specific content warning for an extremely disturbing scene of violence against civilians in one of the later parts of the film. Now, I watched this film because I'd read that it was widely considered one of the greatest anti-war films ever made. But I gotta say, as I was watching it for like the entire first hour, I thought, what the hell? What the hell are these critics talking about? This is way overrated. I mean, yes, there are some interesting surreal elements that are creepy and remind me of David Lynch and kind of speak in a subtle way of the horrors of war, but otherwise, I just couldn't see what these critics were talking about in terms of it being one of the best anti-war films ever made. But then we get to the third act and holy crap, like, wow, now I could see what the critics were talking about. I mean, it is amazing, like genuinely. It's definitely not for the faint of heart, as I just mentioned, but if you want to see one of the craziest, most impressive 
but also one of the most disturbing sequences to ever be filmed in a war movie, in my opinion, then watch this film. Now, I hope I haven't like overhyped it the way I initially thought that critics had overhyped this film until I got to the third act, but at the very least, you'll see what I mean. Okay, so this brings us to number three. Number three is the 1988 animated film, Grave of the Fireflies, from the beloved studio Ghibli. And it is hands down their darkest film. As many people may already know, this film is about two children, uh, four-year-old Satsuko and her older brother, 14-year-old Seta, who are trying to survive in the aftermath of the U.S. bombing of the Japanese city of Kobe during World War II. So much has already been written and said about this film that I won't really add anything here because at the moment I don't really have anything fresh or different to add to it, except to say that it definitely belongs on this list. Number two is the 2004 film Hotel Rwanda and stars Don Cheadle in one of his best performances. It's about the Rwandan Civil War and the genocide perpetrated by the Hutus against the Tutsi. Now, despite some truly nightmarish real-life stories that took place during that war, this film actually does an admirable job of not making the violence any more graphic than it needs to be. In fact, it's a PG-13 film. So while it doesn't cover up the horrors of the war, it also doesn't overwhelm you with uh, the violence. The film does a great job asking a lot of questions. For example, when mass atrocities are taking place, can journalism get the rest of the world to care? And, and more importantly, to intervene. And the film suggests, well, if you're Black, if you're African, then no, the answer is no. And it manages to suggest this without being, in my opinion, overly heavy-handed, which is always you know, a risk with films with um, social or political messages. And there are also some interesting suggestions of the way that colonialism can create, cause, and exacerbate the kinds of ethnic or cultural tensions that can lead to and escalate conflict and war. All of the film's many strengths are enhanced by a truly beautiful and humane performance by Don Cheadle playing real-life hero Paul Rusesa Bagina, who saved over 1,200 refugees' lives by sheltering them in the hotel that he was managing at the time. So Hotel Ronda, great film. Definitely watch this if you can. And finally, my choice for number one will be controversial, and rightfully so. But it's not because of the movie itself, but rather because of who it's associated with. And I'm speaking of the 2002 film, The Pianist, directed by Roman Polanski. Obviously, Polanski is, at best, a highly problematic figure. And for some, I include myself among them, a reprehensible figure. And there's just no getting around the fact that this film is directed by him. And if folks don't want to see it for that reason, that's totally understandable. But in this case, I think it's worth at least considering maybe trying to separate the art from the artist. I do wish Plansky wasn't a director so that everyone could feel comfortable about watching it. But since he is a director, it's up to each person, if you haven't yet seen this movie, whether you want to see it or not. But it, it is truly an amazing film, in my belief, and especially with respect to showing the civilian side of war and all the extremely difficult and horrendous things that go with being a civilian during a time of war, everything from being separated from your family, you know, the ever-present fear of that happening to witnessing atrocities being committed towards other people, some of whom you know, you know, living in a constant state of dread, not knowing when your turn is coming to be the victim and constantly having to scrounge for survival when it comes to your basic needs, such as food and shelter. Just all of that, you know, like I just cover so many of the themes that I've been covering with the other films on this list. This film also has something in common with Germany Year Zero and that both take place in very urban locations. And this allows for some compelling visual symbolism 
in that not only are the lives of the people in the film coming apart and collapsing, this collapse is reflected in the literal and structural collapse of the cities around them in which they live. And just that kind of imagery of hungry people going through crumbled buildings, desperately foraging for food, speaks of the essence of deep collapse louder than any words that could be spoken about collapse. So those are my top 10 films about war from the civilian perspective. And finally, before I end today's episode, at this point, most people are probably aware of numerous charitable organizations and efforts that are geared towards helping uh, Ukrainians during this humanitarian crisis. But just in case anyone's not, there are a few major ones worth mentioning again, just in case you may not know of them. One of them is ukrainenow.org. And it's a global website and organization where you can sign up to volunteer in various possible ways. Uh, you can also, if you're in the position of being able to sign up to host Ukrainians who've escaped their country and the sign up form asks all kinds of questions like, you know, how many people can you host? Uh, can you host people if they have pets and, and things like that. Next, there's standwithukraine.how. H-O-W, so standwithukraine.h-o-w. And this site lists a bunch of different ways you can contribute depending on your situation. Not every way of helping necessarily involves money or a lot of time or fancy skills, you know, or hosting people in your home or, or significant commitments like that. And if you're under resource, there are still ways that you could pitch in uh, that don't involve having many resources. And finally, another website with a similar but slightly different URL as the one previous is standwithukraine.live. Live. The other one was standwithukraine.how, H-O-W. This one is standwithukraine.live or live. Uh, I'm not really sure which one that is, but uh, uh, live, L-I-V-E. And this one is mostly oriented around finding a protest that you can join no matter where in the world you live. And the site also offers helpful lists of many different nonprofit and charitable organizations that are helping out in various ways that you could potentially become involved with in some way if you feel inclined to do so. Okay, that does it for this episode. To close us out today, I'm going to use Chopin's Polonaise Opus 40 Number no. 1 in A Major, also known as the Military Polonaise. And I just wanted to quickly explain the reason I wanted to use this piece of music. The music of Chopin has a very deep and rich significance for the Polish people, but also just generally for anyone who is familiar with the fascinating history surrounding Chopin's music in relation to the struggles of the Polish people during the 19th and 20th centuries. In the latter century, especially, the music of Chopin came to represent the pride of the Polish people and their strength and endurance while being occupied by the Nazis during World War II, which was fitting given that Chopin himself was a fiercely proud nationalist. Now, the word nationalist has taken on ugly connotations in more recent years and certainly can be a dark and negative force. But generally speaking, nationalism, when it's not so obnoxious, can also be a positive force when it becomes a source of strength in the face of oppression. And in this way, despite being officially banned by the Nazis from ever being played or performed in public, Chopin's music was a source of great solace and comfort for the Polish people during the Second World War. And so in honor and recognition of that, we'll close out today's episode with this royalty-free rendition of Chopin's Military Polonaise, performed and recorded here by the amateur pianist Pistos. I hope I'm saying that right. Distributed freely under a Creative Commons license. So thank you for listening. Until next time, I am the pop pathologist, and this is Chopin.
hope you enjoyed that episode. Please subscribe, and if you're willing, share one of these episodes on social media. And if your chosen podcast platform allows reviews, like Apple Podcasts, I invite you to leave a review as well. Thank you.